And now we're on to engine start, and everything I've done in the cockpit so far, probably in the real world, 30-40 seconds worth of just looking around and throwing switches. In the sim world, probably, I mean, what have I really done other than throw five or six switches? But it's this first time through the procedure where I'm going to learn 90% of what I learn about the aircraft, so that's why I always take my time on this first time through. Okay, so let's get back into before starting engines. External power connect if necessary. We're going to do this one as a battery start, so I don't need external power. We saw during the walk around the receptacle on the left side aft that would be used. We're not. Seat adjust if AC power is on. Now I have a switch down here, seat adjustment down and up. It's not going to work off of battery because we only have DC, direct current. I need to get the generators up and running or external power. That would be alternating current power coming to the aircraft for that to work. We might look at that a little later if I remember to adjust it. Danger areas fore and aft clear. Now, I would verify this with the crew chief, making sure that the intake danger area is out to about... Oh, 25 feet is a good rule of thumb, but it varies from engine to engine. I think this one's actually, if I go to the next page... Yeah, 15 feet is the quota danger area at idle for the air being sucked into the intake. It's a lot of air going down those things, and any loose items or equipment in this area has the risk of getting sucked into the engine, damaging the engine, or, well, frankly, killing a person. So 15 feet at idle, 25 feet at max power, but, you know, in the real world, working around a jet engine... Well, it varies from aircraft to aircraft. On F-16s, I would not get anywhere near the things. 25 feet is what I always went by. Uh, same for F-22s, briefly when I was on those. F-117s, it just wasn't an issue at all because most of the air came through doors on top of the intakes. And for exhaust, the rule of thumb is 200 feet if you're parking a vehicle or equipment. In reality, yeah, like right here, it's telling us basically 80 feet for an F5 with these J85 engines. And then on the side, we have five foot danger areas for the auxiliary air intake doors, but again, that's just for max power. So, okay, we'll take that as good. And then starting engines. We'll start with the left engine, and you do the left engine first on the F5 because with just the battery on, we're only going to have engine instrumentation for the left-hand engine. We have RPM up here, temperature, nozzle position, and then fuel flow, and until the generator comes online, we're not going to have right engine instrumentation. That's why we do the left first. Okay, so external air apply, and I'm going to come to the comms menu. I'm going to go F8 for the ground crew. Actually, before I do the air, I'm going to request wheel chock, so I'm going to go F4 Machine in place. So that's going to keep me from rolling forwards or rolling backwards. As we get into the start, it's actually very, very great that we're starting to get aircraft with these. The next trick is just getting them so that they're just installed by default. I don't know why they wouldn't be for a, a ground start, but, well, I guess I'll just be happy that they're there at all nowadays. And then I'm going to come to the comms menu and go F8, ground crew, F5 for ground air supply, and I'm going to have them connected, F1. Now, air is going to be connected at the rear of the aircraft, just to the left of the tail hook at the bottom. I think we saw that during the walk around. So now, it's F8 for the ground crew, ground air supply, and I need to go F3 to have them apply it. Now, let me read ahead here real quick, just so that we don't get surprised by anything that's coming up. Okay, external air apply. That's just going to have them actually flip a switch and apply the air. At 10% RPM, start button push. So I'm going to be watching the RPM gauge up here on the left side, when this needle gets to 10, that means that I can push the, uh, there we go, start button for the left hand engine. That's going to start a timer, 40 second timer, for application of power to the ignition circuit. And pretty much simultaneously, I'll pull the throttle out of cutoff and into idle. That's going to open the fuel shutoff valve to the left engine. Okay, then caution, if light up does not occur within five seconds, retard the throttle off. Continue motoring for at least one minute to purge the engine before attempting a start. Or if EGT reaches 845, and I'll have the EGT gauge right here, if it gets up to about the 12 o'clock position, I suppose, on that gauge. Retard the throttle, continue motoring for one minute. And what it means by motoring is I just leave the air applied. So applying the air is going to just on its own motor the engine or just rotate the engine. We'll see that here in a second. And then engine instruments check within limits, hydraulic pressure 28 to 3200 psi, generator caution light out, aux intake door indicator barber pulled, 
So we can see the aux intake doors up here is to close right now. And by barber pole, it means that it's going to have a striped indication. Okay, so let's go ahead and run through this. Now it's going to be apply F3. Copy. Yeah, there we go. We have uh, communications now. Okay, we see the RPMs coming up. I can hear it. It's above 10%. And there's no hurry on this. Like I said, this is just motoring the engine. It's just turning the engine. So now we need to come down here. Okay, lift engine. I'm going to push it. That's going to energize that ignition circuit. Start the timer. I'm going to pull the throttle out of cutoff. Okay, light off. Was it within five seconds? ITT or EGT? EGT is yep, stabilizing below 800. RPMs are continuing to come up. Okay, nozzle position has moved up to 50%. I've got a good fuel flow on the left engine. I've got, okay, the temperature just came down, way down. Wow, that's uh, kind of odd. I'll have a look at that here in a bit. Okay, and then left-hand oil pressure is within the green band. I've got the aux intake door indicator barber pole. That just means that the left-hand doors are open. The right-hand doors are not. And I've got, okay, utility hydraulic pressure. I was looking for 3,000 PSI plus or minus 200, and that is within the green. It's up above the, like, upper edge of the scale, but that's still within the limit. So that, as far as I can tell, was a, a good start on the left engine. Okay, so I've got engine instruments check, hydraulics, got it. Generator caution light out, okay, on the caution panel, the left-hand generator. Light is out. We can still see that the right-hand generator and the right-hand hydraulic or the flat hydraulic system lights are on. And I guess this is a good spot to look at hydraulics. And I'll bring up the manual. This is the DCS manual. I'll just go off the simplified schematic at the very end. So we have the left-hand utility system on the left, flight hydraulic or flight control hydraulic system on the right. So either system can run the flight controls. And I didn't see it, but... I'll look back there and, yeah, I can't really see anything from the cockpit either. You'll have seen the flight controls center up, I'm sure, as hydraulic pressure came onto the left-hand system. And then the utility system is going to run, okay, wheel brakes, landing gear, nose strut, nose wheel steering, speed brake, the stab aux system, gun bay, purge doors, just the little miscellaneous systems. And then the right-hand system is dedicated solely to flight controls. So in the event that we... For example, lose the left-hand engine that runs the utility system. That would mean that we would have to start using some alternate means to extend the gear, break the aircraft, use the speed brakes. It doesn't say anything here about the flaps, does it? I wonder which system the flaps are controlled from. It doesn't really say here. Let me dig into the manual. I'll be right back. And there we go. Under wing flap system, each flap surface is operated by an AC-powered electrical actuator. So those aren't hydraulically operated at all. Okay, neat. I had not picked that up on my first read-through of the, the manual. Okay, so let's press on here to the right engine. Now, the right engine start can be done one of two ways. We can do it exactly like we did the lift engine using bleed air provided by the air start cart or dash 60 or whatever type of cart is available to provide air from the ground. Or you can do a cross bleed start. And there's a procedure right here to use bleed air coming off the lift engine to turn the right engine. I am not going to do that. I'm going to just go through the normal start process. I'll probably later on try it just to know how to do it, but the right engine procedure is just, well, like it says here on step one, same as the left engine, and then just check intake door indicator, open, and then disconnect power and air. So let's go ahead and do this. I'll have to go to the comms menu, and it's going to be F8. Ground air supply. Okay, so let's go ahead and apply F3. And after the Copy. left engine is up and running, it just automatically steps over. It's actually controlled from the ground which engine it goes to. In this case, we don't have to do any action. We just tell them to apply. Okay, we're above 10%. And again, no hurry on that. It's just motoring the engine. Okay, so it's going to be right push and right throttle out of cutoff. Okay, light off within 5, RPMs coming up, temperature stabilizing, okay, about 790 or so, and I expect that to come back down. Okay, nozzle position, fuel flow right is up, oil pressure right is within the green, hydraulic pressure for the right side flight control system is in the green, aux intake doors are open, 
And that is a good start on the right-hand engine. Okay.